Thank you very much, Callum, and thank you for Kirsty from RICS Matrix for organising this. So my name's David Inman. You'll be pleased to know I'm a chartered surveyor, so I'm talking about the right, the right topic. I'm also an APC chairman and assessor. What I am as well is a big fan of the APC process because it works. The APC is fair, it's holistic. Uh, I've seen lots of candidates over the years and the standard is consistent. So whilst the APC for candidates, and when you're a candidate, you do think it's this huge burden. It isn't, it's a process. And it's a process that if you're organized and in the right job, you will be successful because it's a competency work-based assessment. But I mentioned the, the term banana skin. The ethics rules of conduct competency is one that is probably the competency that causes the most referrals. And in our hour together, however long we're going to be together today, I want to tell you how to avoid the banana skin and step over it. What I'm not going to do is tell you how to pass because these new rules of conduct that were introduced this year are totally different. They're very self-reflective. A few weeks ago, I'm on, a, I'm on some APC forums on WhatsApp and a candidate says, have you got an acronym where I can memorise the new five rules of conduct? And yes, you, you need to know what one to five are, but you can't, you can't memorise it. It's got to be reflective on your experience and the experience about your employment. The problem is you have to do levels one, two, and three. Level one, of course, is knowing it. Level two is doing it. And level three is giving independence advice. But how can you give independence advice on RICS rules of conduct for firms if you don't manage an RICS accredited firm? Well, I'm gonna say fortunately, I'm not gonna be negative today, Fortunately, you've got to know how to run a regulated firm to pass your APC. Because the time all, uh, uh, an APC chair will phrase it, should you be successful today, you may want to set up in practice on your own. And this will lead to various questions. And some of these questions we will we'll have a, a chat about later on in our time together. End of the day, you can pass your APC. The next day you can set up as a firm of chartered surveyors and become regulated by RICS. And that's why it's, this competency is, is vital. It, it really is. RICS isn't a traditional company and it's not a charity. It's a royal charter company. And the royal charter dictates how RICS as an organization runs. And under this royal charter, some bylaws. I would strongly recommend that all APC candidates read the bylaws. I'm not saying memorize them, but read them because everything to do with rules of conduct will be put into context. Think of it this way you work for a company and they've got a policy. The rules of conduct and the bylaws are the policy. The actual procedures are your professional indemnity insurance requirements, your client monthly, your client money handling requirements. So I would definitely recommend that you read the bylaws. Now we work, we live in strange times. We our ICS is based in a, a liberal, modern Western democracy. The Economist magazine, this is just to put the world we're practicing in into context. The Economist magazine has a democracy index, and it says that only 6.4% of the world lives in a full democracy. This doesn't include the United States of America, which might include you know, a, bit of a, a bit of election shenanigans a few years ago. That's classed as a flawed democracy. So there's only 6.4% of people in full democracies. 39% in flawed democracies. 17 what they call hybrid regimes, and 37% of the world live in authoritarian regimes. And RICS, bless it, is trying to apply a rules of conduct for members and firms 
in countries that might be in authoritarian regimes. And that's why the new rules of conduct that were launched this year are relatively vague and, self, and, and do require this level of self-awareness and self-reflection, both for members and firms. Similarly, the organization called Freedom House says that only 20% of the world's population lives in what they class as a free country. So there's a decline in democracy. So our ICS has a challenge to implement rules of conduct based on Western liberal values across the world. So our ICS is the regulator. But what I'm hoping is increasingly in time, we regulate yourselves. I think it's been quite apparent recently that the world is awash with dirty money, money laundering, and across the world, you know, modern slavery is tragically still rife. As a profession, this is my view, and by the way, this session, this, these are my views, not necessarily the views of our ICS, but in my view, we need to stop the enablers of money laundering, the enablers of modern slavery. What you've got to ask yourself is, would you have the courage of your convictions if there was a large residential property transaction in London involving, let's say, a former owner of Chelsea Football Club? Would you flag that up as concern or would you just take the fee and proceed? Great, nice, nice little learner there, selling this multi-million pound mansion. Thanks very much. I'll have my fee, please. Here's my invoice. Or would you make a stand? Similarly, we've got the World Cup coming on. Coming up. There's been lots of accusations of some terrible labour practices. A lot of construction work is being killed. A lot of construction workers basically being, you know, in modern slavery to build the World Cup. You know, it's a football tournament, for heaven's sake. It's not that, Im not that important at the end of the day. But as a profession, if you were asked to, as a, if you were a quantity surveyor and asked to do work on a construction project, and part of this did involve costing labour from dubious sources, would you have the conviction to make the stand? And I hope as a profession, yes, our ICS has its role in regulating, but it's got limited resources. We all stop the enablers and our ICS is a beacon of good practice and honesty. But this is where we're gonna diverge a little bit. There's the rules of conduct, but there's also the requirements of you as an RICS member of any grade, and also requirements of an RICS regulated firm. And I speak as somebody who runs an RICS regulated firm, and I'm the responsible principal for that firm. There used to be three key documents from RICS. There used to be the rules of conduct for firms, the rules of conduct for members, and the five ethical and professional standards. They've all gone now, and they've all been incorporated in to the new rules of conduct. The great old saying from group captain, Sir Douglas Barder, who was a double amputee, World War II, RA fighter ace. If you wanna see a good movie, watch Reach for the Skies, starring Sir Kenneth Moore. A great, good old black and white World War II movie. If it's ever on TV, watch it. But Douglas Bard was somewhat of a maverick. He'd lost both his legs in a flying accident. And he kind of manipulated the rules to get back into active combat and become a World War II fighter ace. And he had a saying and a famous quote from him, and I'm going to read this. Rules for the obedience of fools and the guidance of wise men. Rules are for the obedience of fools and the guidance of wise men. And this, I think, fits perfectly 
to the new RICS rules of conduct. If you memorize the rules, now the rules are formed, there's five rules of conduct, and we're gonna go through them shortly. There's five rules of conduct and what's called Appendix A. Appendix A is how you as an individual and me as a firm need to interact in my relationship with RICS. To be honest, Appendix A should be right at the front, but that's just a bit of, a bit of trivia from me. Under each rule, there's example behaviours. They are examples how you can apply that particular rule of conduct. If you, for your APC, was just to robotically memorise them, if you're entering any form of discussion with your APC assessment panel chair at final assessment, you probably just rattle off some answers parrot fashion. That's not what this is about. This is about understanding the rules of conduct and using the rules of conduct for guidance is for wise APC candidates. So don't think by memorizing parrot fashion verbatim, the rules of conduct and example behaviors, you're gonna sail through. You're gonna struggle somewhat. You've got to understand them. And that's, if there's one thing I can ask you, if you're doing your APC to take away from today's session is learn how to apply the rules of conduct. Now, in terms of rules of conduct, I've put a link out on LinkedIn. I've got lots of information away from here. So if you want to study in more detail, I've got a course you can subscribe to on Udemy on this subject. So if you want a three hour course on that, you can subscribe to it. I've got lots of APC resources on my YouTube channel. So I will put them on Twitter at D-I-E-M-L-T-D, you just look for me, David Inman, on Twitter. I'll do that later on this afternoon. I'll, I'll upload them on Twitter as well. And there's some signposts for more study and more investigation because we've got an hour together, not a long period of time to cover a large area of practice. But for us, you know, I mentioned the APC has got three levels, level one, level two, and level three. Level one, level one, level two, yeah, you can kind of muddle through. But unless you're running an RICS regulated firm, how on earth can you demonstrate level three? Well, you don't have to. You can simulate it. And I always recommend that all APC candidates form a pretend desktop company. Please tell your employer what you're doing because they don't want to find bits of paper with Fred Bloggs Surveying Limited in the office thinking you're, you're going to leave them. But set up a pretend RICS regulated company as if you were setting up in practice yourself. All the information is on the RICS website, what you need to do. All the context is in the bylaws. and the rules are in rules one to five of the rules of conduct and appendix A. So I want to start off quite logically with rule one. I'll read this out. Members and firms must be honest, act with integrity and comply with their professional obligations, including obligations to RICS. So this is a wide area of practice and it's in a nutshell, it's all about integrity. It's about dealing with potential bribery threats. A huge, you know, a lot of APC candidates who I see struggling at final assessment don't seem to understand the difference between guidance from RICS and a requirement. So a professional statement is mandatory. So the professional statements on anti-corruption, bribery and terrorist financing is mandatory. So good, honest business practice. And I think, you know, in the news, people who've allegedly had their, their vast wealth acquired via un underhand means and maybe money laundering, that's been very much in the news at the moment. 
So this is not just about protecting the profession. It's about protecting yourself. You know, it, we're lucky in the UK that we've got the Bribery Act 2010. So we're protected by law, but you might be working somewhere else where facilitation payments and brown envelopes may be the norm. But if you're working for a UK firm, you're still covered by the Bribery Act. So it's protecting yourself and it's honest, being honest and acting with integrity. Dealing with conflicts, you know, sometimes the client might have a disagreement with you. It's handling conflicts, handling them professionally. You might handle client money. And with the APC, you may never, ever handle client money. I personally, I've been in private practice for 16 years, and I've never handled one penny of client money. But you've still got to understand it for your APC. Let me put it this way. If you hold a UK driving license or you, you're learning to drive in the UK, as part of your driving test, you've got to have a theory test. So this competency is like your theory test for your driving test. I'm quite lucky. I, I learned to drive. I passed my driving test in 1991. So back then it was the driving instructor asked you a few questions and you, you squinted to see if you could read a number plate or not. It sounds incredibly antiquated now, but things progress through time. So think about this competency and performing at your final assessment as your driving test, theory test. And also you, you, you're signing up for obligations between you and RICS. Surely, if you're investing time and money to join an organisation as a member, understand the rules, understand the requirements, and understand the actual requirements our ICS have on you. I see this, the, the topic of service charges crop up quite frequently at APC final assessments. And people seem blissfully unaware of the RICS's mandatory requirements for what can and can't go into a service charge. So, you know, understand the context in which you work. Understand as much as you can about the organisation you're already a member of, but become, want to become a, a professional member of. Right, rule number two. I'm going to read this again. Members and firms must maintain their professional competence and ensure that the services are provided by competent individuals who have the necessary expertise. Competency is an area that fascinates me. No disrespect to anybody I've ever worked with, but the brightest person I ever worked with left school at 15 and worked in an abattoir. He ended up working with British Rail, shoveling ballast, because it, he earned more money. And over 25 years, how it worked then, he had an exam and an interview to get promoted. Exam, an interview, exam, an interview. Exam. So by the, you know, I worked with this guy quite late on in his career, and he was an absolute, the bright, brightest, brightest, brightest person I've ever worked with. So competence isn't all about education. It's a mixture of education, knowledge, and experience. And that's why I'm such a, a great believer in the APC process. It's holistic. You know, it looks at your level one knowledge. It looks at your level two experience. And it looks at, you know, the advice and reasoning that you give for level three. But in terms of your APC, that's the competency. And the RICS meets, in effect, rule two by deeming you competent via the process of the APC. But in terms of competencies, as you, when you pass your APC, you've got to do 20 hours CPD a year. Minimum of 10 hours of which must be formal, 10 hours informal. They're the requirements. So I mentioned before, rules and requirements. We've got rule two here, 
under it, the C actual CPD requirements that RICS may, may and Callum and all other qualified members follow. But in this case, competence includes any subcontractors. So if your organization, you know, oh, we'll, we'll sub it out, forget about it, forget about it. Can't do that. You've got to ensure that your subcontractors are competent. I've, I've, I do some corporate audits from time to time. And the, the question of how do you ensure your contractors, subcontractors comp are competent? And I've had some right old rows over the years. One, one managing director of a company said, do you expect me to ask my supply chain whether they're competent or not? Well, yeah, because my clients are paying you to deliver that service. And, you know, some, somebody else saying, you know, is your com contractor competent? Well, yeah. How do you determine this? We've already used them. So competency through the profession is vital both getting the getting the competency passing your apc and that's why the apc is in place and also maintaining it so the profession and us as professionals can remain relevant and useful to society rule three members and firms must provide good quality and diligent services i do some work in quality management around iso 9001 which is the international quality management standard and this is boring on that I'm, a, I'm actually a lead quality auditor so when I, when I saw this coming to the rules of conduct I was enthused but quality yes it's whether your organized your firm has QA checks and the work that you're sending out is correct but also it's whether you can explain you, you, you might be times where you'll have to explain some quite technical work to a layperson. Clients may engage the services of yourself or your employers because you're the experts. They're not the experts. That's why, that's why they're using you. So can you explain your work? And it's all about giving a good service. I've run a business for 16 years and you're only as good as the last job. And you know what keeps things ticking over year on year? Repeat business, working with clients, building relationships, and giving a good level of service. And also, you know, as sorry, somebody, somebody, somebody spoke then. Uh, I'll ignore that. For the for the consultation for this rules of conduct, the new rules of conduct, RICS put it out to members. This is what we're proposing. What do you think? And the person who led the project actually requested to speak to me because I, I had some concerns over the original draft. So we spent about a, a couple of hours on the phone working through the draft together. And this is after I'd submitted it. So this end result... I was partially involved in and the, the big shift in the, the profession. I want you to join me on this. I also want you to join me in May when Merseyside and Cheshire Matrix are running another CPD session on sustainability. So I'm not going to get too sidetracked into the, the fantastic world of sustainability now uh, because we've got another session in May. So keep an eye out for that. But also RICS, as part of these rules of conduct, want us to, an example of behaviour is to give sustainable solutions. As a profession, I think we've been rather shy over the years to think, to say that we are a sustainability profession. We're probably the original sustainability profession. I've, I first got involved in RICS, and this probably seems an awful long time ago, in 1990, 1992, when I was an undergraduate. I did a mineral surveying degree, it was all about minerals extraction and landfill landfill developments and land developments it was very much based in environments and sustainability and the business behind it so RICS is one of the original sustainability professions in 2022 I'm an assessor for RICS for the Chartered Environmental Scheme so when you successfully your APC 
if you work in the sustainability field, you can become a chartered environmentalist through our ICS. Well. But I digress. But giving sustainable solutions, you know, it's key. I am noting, by the way, and apologies for this, I am going to offer some Q&A at the end. So please tap away in the comments box. I am going to come back to them and answer the questions in, in one, one foul swoop at the end of our time together. Rule four, members and firms must treat others with respect and encourage diversity and inclusion. We're very lucky. Well, I'm, those of us are based in the UK, we're very lucky. We've got the Equality Act. I think attitudes have improved greatly over the years. There's still some work to do in terms of diversity and inclusion. Things aren't perfect, but things have, you know, since I was a, a, a wee kid in the 70s and 80s, society has improved for the better. But what happens if you are working in areas where diversity and inclusion aren't encouraged? There's some, company, in some countries where LGBT plus is illegal. It's hard to, it's hard to conceive that, you know, in a, a modern Western democracy such as the UK, other countries, that's, you know, it's illegal. Same with modern slavery. It's rife. It's absolutely rife. It's shocking. So we must treat others with respect and encourage diversity and inclusion. Wherever in the work we're working. There are some moral arguments with this. If you were asked to work in a country where, let's say, gender rights are very poor compared to how are they in the UK. Would you go and work there? You can always say no, but would you want to go there and challenge it? And again, these are personal decisions that come out of these rules of conduct. And as I said, they're not for memorising, they're for applying and learning, and applying to life and applying you know, to your careers. Some of you may be at the start of your careers, some of you, you might be at the midpoint or later on in your careers. But, you know, this, you know, it's been a big move, this by RICS. And this, what I think has been the most important rule change is rule four. And including this is unconscious bias. You start to become more aware of society around you, people around you. <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, RICS has done some fantastic work over the years. But as a profession, nine to only 19% of our members women that's this that's a disgrace you know we must be doing something wrong as a profession so you know we want an equal open diverse and inclusive profession and the only way we can do it is do it ourselves we are the profession yes yes our ICS have got some talented and dedicated staff and own a building in London and have an office in Edinburgh and Birmingham and various other places but it's only us as members who can transform the profession and society for the better. And finally, five out of five, rule five. Members and firms must act in the public interest, take responsibility for their actions and act to prevent harm and maintain public confidence in the profession. It's public confidence. Why do I bother, reg, why do I bother being a chartered surveyor? Why do I bother running a regulated firm because I'm a chartered surveyor because I want to demonstrate to my clients and future clients the public confidence in the profession now poor old RICS has had a bit of a hammering over the last few years but it's changing itself and changing for the better I think there's been the lever review with some governance issues a couple of years ago I'll not I'll not go into it so there is a webinar I put on YouTube that's free on the Levitt Review. And RICS, after some governance issues, appointed Alison Levitt QC, now Judge Levitt, to perform an independent review. Things have changed, people change at RICS, and there's now a review called the Bishard Review, run by Lord Michael Bishard, which is reforming where RICS sits, and I think sits in society because it's all about public confidence. 
you know, I've got the little RICS logo on my letterhead and business cards. You know, when people used to give business cards out, I don't do that because I like flashing the, the little decapitated lion logo around. I do it because I believe in RICS and as chartered surveyors in the that give public confidence. And this brings us into you know, to the, the realm of firm management. Some candidates I've spoken to over the years think it's rather unfair that they should be required to learn how to run an RICS regulated firm. But as, I, but as I've said earlier on in our session, you can pass your APC. And the next day you can set up an RICS regulated firm and all the fun and games that goes with it. Now, for me, I find working and running an RICS regulated firm is incredibly beneficial. I, I deal with people who, who run non-RICS accredited, accredited consultancies and they go, how much professional indemnity insurance do I need? Oh, no, I need a bit of that indemnity insurance. Yeah, yeah. What do I need? Whereas me, as a chartered surveyor and a, somebody who runs a regulated firm, I say, I need £250,000 of cover because my turnover is up to £100,000 a year. It's easy. RICS mate, run in a regulated firm. Easy for me. I need a complaints handling procedure. Right, let's look at what RICS require. I need to buy insurance. Where do I buy insurance from? Ah, there's a list of approved underwriters and I need an RICS worded insurance policy. Being a chartered surveyor makes my life easy from a a practice management point of view. How I use the RICS logo. RICS tell me how to use the RICS logo. So there's some great benefits of becoming a regulated firm. I was speaking the other week from with a chap who's works for a large utilities company. And the little estates department within that utilities company has become regulated by RICS, by what's called a regulated practice division. Now, not many organisations do this, but they see the benefits of their little property group in this large organisation being regulated by RICS, and you can do it. It's called a regulated practice division because they see the benefits in the public confidence. So when they're going out to landowners and land agents and doing deals and negotiating and negotiating permits and all the rest of the good stuff they do, They've got the public confidence, not by just being chartered surveyors, but working for a regulated firm, which is a little part of a big firm. So, for example, Tesco, this is just um, hypothetical. Tesco is a large company. They'll have a property department. That property department may want to become regulated by RICS. So you've got Tesco. And you've got the little property departments. The little property departments come, come a regulated practice division. Interesting stuff. As you can see, I'm interested by this. Uh, many of you will set up your own practices. You'll need to become regulated by RICS. And you'll find it interesting because it's useful. This is, it's, it's useful for me who runs a business. However, it also covers your personal life. I will take a drink of water for the next bit. Without naming names, I've met quite a few RICS presidents over the years. And they've all been rather charming and polite and engaging and worthy to lead our organisation. Apart from one who, who will remain nameless. I was at an event in Manchester. Man at Old Trafford, Lancashire Cricket Club at Old Trafford. And I had my charter today's 1938 club tie with the RSS logo. And this past president come up to me and jabbed my tie whilst holding a biscuit. And he got crumbs all down me. I was a little bit annoyed. What's that on your tie? And I didn't, I didn't warm to the chap. I hadn't warmed to the chap earlier on in the day because he said, as chartered surveyors, you're on duty for the RICS. 24 hours a day. What a load of rubbish. However, there's a little ring of truth in it. 
under the bylaws, if you get charged with a first offence, with with a first offence in the UK can be a custodial sentence, you've got to report it to RICS. Every now and again, I have a look at the disciplinaries, the RICS website. Some of them, I suspect, drink had been taken. And it sounds like it was a punch up outside the dog and duck on a Saturday night, which I'm not condoning. Stupid behaviour. Grow up. Grow, and it's always, it's always fellas. Grow up, boys. But I read one last year where somebody had been charged with a fray or something involving fisticuffs. Not only did they been prosecuted in a court of law, because technically it could have been, they could have been sent to jail and they didn't tell RICS. RICS regulation come along and said, right, we're doing you as well because you didn't tell us. Fine. I think they fined them. Grand, a couple of grand. Crazy. You know, so you need to tell RICS. Don't get in trouble in the first place. Don't go to jail. You know, it's a very, very wise lesson in life. But, you know, it, whilst you're not on duty for RICS 24 hours a day, you do have some responsibility as a chartered surveyor. Which brings me on to the final part of Rule 5, which is about raising concerns. So today I've mentioned dirty money, dodgy oligarchs, human trafficking and modern day slavery. You need to ask yourself, do you have the courage of your convictions to raise it? I once saw somebody getting assaulted at work and I raised it. I told my boss, and he said, oh, you, sh you, shouldn't have, you, sh you shouldn't have seen that. You shouldn't have seen that. I <laughs> you shouldn't have seen that. We could both get sacked. What? Well, anyway, it went through the due HR process, and the person who'd been attacked, as you turn around to me, caught to see me months later and said, you know, thank you. That's been going on for about a year. So have the courage of your convictions. If something's not right, raise concerns. We need to make this world, you know, it's, it's a rotten old world at the moment, not just with what, the terrible things that's going on in Ukraine, but all around the world, you know, democracies on the way and corruption's rising. So as RICS professionals, we do need to raise concerns. And there's the old... Well, it's client confidentiality. And, oh, I can't. You know, I know my client's breaking the law, but I can't tell them. Can you not? Dig deep enough into the bylaws, and that'll help you sleep at night. So raise concerns. Also, if it's about another RICS regulated firm who's acting inappropriately or illegally, raise it with RICS. RICS regulation do not sit there waiting to hit people with a big stick. RICS regulation are very helpful. I've, I've raised bits of queries on how I've interpreted the requirements to, re to register a firm. And they're very helpful, very helpful. And I, you know, even I need to, I've just done my annual return as a regulated firm. I needed to change change the address on it, I need to contact somebody. I thought, oh, it's going to take a month. It took them about two hours. You know, the email about the same day. Yeah, no problem, David. We've changed your address. So don't be frightened of contacting RICS. Regulation, whilst they are there, yes, to police us, we have got to be self-regulating also, and they are very helpful. Please remember that through your career. And also, they are confidential. So I've mentioned this five rules of conduct. There's also Appendix A, and I, I will still say Appendix A should be at the front of the rules of conduct. And this will, will basically spells out how you as a professional and me as a professional and also me as an RICS regulated firm, we interact with RICS. It's kind of a service level agreement. So if RICS wants some information from me, I will give it to them. But it's helpful. People see the rules of conduct as this great burden. 
it's here to help us. It really is. So that's the new rules of conduct. Understand it. There's plenty of resources out there, whether it's my course on Udemy, and I've, I've, as I said, I've put a link on LinkedIn uh, today, and I'll, I'll put it on Twitter later on today for my Udemy course. But RICS do some case studies on different scenarios with the rules of conduct. Get under the skin of those. Start chatting about them. And talk to each other about them. Help each other. You know what? You're very lucky to have Matrix. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastic network. Unfortunately, meeting up in person has obviously not been possible. We're not Kirsty and the team across the country who are doing some sterling work to rebuild the groups. If there's no group local to you, why not form one? The more you put into this profession, the more you get out. And I, I, I was a, a Matrix chair for two years in, in Lancashire and I got a lot out of it and I built up a really nice network around me. A network that's still, every now and again, so we will approach with some work, which quite being pragmatic about it, it does further your career. I know people I've met in Matrix, they've got new jobs out of it. It's, I won't say opened up doors, but it's a good way of putting yourself in the shop window. Might put yourself, might put yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit, but that's a good thing. Build your confidence. But, you know, away from here, start thinking about networks online. Start talking to each other about the case studies behind the rules of conduct. Because I can't, I can't say often enough, if you try and memorise these rules of conduct and don't try and apply them, you will struggle. You really will. You know, don't sit there and just read them out of verbatim in your final assessment. You'll be asked how it applies and how it applies through the work that you've submitted. Before we get onto a Q and A, I'm just gonna, as an AP, as an APC assessor and an assessment chair, we are not fed any crib sheets from our ICS. I will confirm now there are no standard questions. Our ICS doesn't contact us and say, ask a question about this. You'll be asked questions based upon your experience, submissions, and your competency requirements. However, there are some quite common questions that crop up. The main one is about indemnity insurance. When you need it, what level of cover you need? Where you get insurance from? Well, there's a list on the RICS website of approved insurers, and you must take a policy from them that's written on RICS terms. Boom. That's the, that's the level of questioning that final assessment. You're not going to get in, you know, your final assessment's an hour. 10 minutes of that is you speaking. So it's going to be a short blast at the end, the questioning on this. And by learning how to apply the rules of conduct and the requirements of RICS professionals and RICS regulated firms, you'll go into your final assessment going, they could ask me whatever I want on uh, ethics and rules of conduct because I know my stuff and I know how to apply it. You will do. So when an assessment, an assessor chair said, if you were to have a turnover of £150,000 a year, what level of PI cover would you need? There, boom, you give the answer straight away. And it builds your confidence. Runoff cover, that's a, that's a classic question. When do you need runoff cover? Oh, a candidate sometime ago and just guessed. Never guess. Never, ever, ever guess these answers. There is a bit of a get out of jail card. If you have a complete mind fog on a regulation related question, you can always say, I can't remember it quite now, but I would look on the RICS website. You might get away with it, you might not. Undo it once though. Because what assessors are looking for, we're not looking for a great genius. We're not looking for the, 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 the genius candidates who are going to change the profession. We're looking for a safe pair of hands that we can trust to be let loose on society. And if they want to set up a firm, 
and use the letters behind the name. So we're looking for a safe pair of hands. So if you're floundering away, guessing what runoff cover is, that's not what we're looking for. If you have a complete mind fog and so I don't know, but I would look on the RICS website. Yeah, you know, that's what you would do. You'd, you would look on the RICS website. So reasoned, steady professionals. Complaints handling procedure, how many stages, what you need for that. Classic question. Client money handling. Uh, best answer I had for this is, I used to take the checks to the bank. No, that's not client money handling. Uh, client money handling is you handle clients' money, whether you know, it could be a deposit for something, and it's how you protect that money. Whether, whether you work for an RICS regulated firm or not, there's thousands of successful APC candidates who will never, ever, ever work for an RICS regulated firm. The thousands who will never handle clients' money, but you still got to know it. You've still, you, you, you've still got to know it. Same, same you know, with your driving test. You've got to learn the road signs. You may never see a real obscure road sign for a, a bridge on a, on a dockside raising, but you still got to know it. CPD requirements, we've talked about this already. You know, when, should, it, it, it always starts off like, should you be successful today at your final assessments? What, what CPD requirements would you need to meet to satisfy our ICS's requirements? Well, I need 10 hours, minimum 10 hours formal, 10 hours informal. Boom, question answered. Nice and easy. One that comes up quite often is the subject of a law come. I'm a sole practitioner. Heaven forbid something happens to me. Do I just leave all my clients in the lurch? No, I've got arrangements in place where my work can be passed on to another company. I may not be able to do anything about it because I'm, I might not be here. And it's, it's a horrible thing to think about, but the locum is what a, char a firm of charter space puts in place should they be incapacitated. I might win the Euro millions. Who knows? I might want to keep the firm going. Who knows? <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to around the world cruise for six months. I'll get a law come in. Unlikely to happen, to be honest. Even things like using, you know, it's, in, it's, it's good running a regulated firm because I know how to use the logo. I know, I know how to do all the branding and be compliant with our ICS. It's very helpful. It really is helpful. I mentioned my YouTube channel. There's lots, lots and lots and lots of APC videos on there. They been a, I've had a bit of a break from the APC for a month. There's been some railway engineering videos on there, but the core of the, the channel is the APC and everything's free on it. And I produce what's called lightning guides and they're 60 seconds. Boom. Everything you need to know about this subject in 60 seconds. And they're, uh, uh, I think they're a good revision tool. Why do I do the YouTube channel? Because I want to give something back. You know, many a charter today has been very helpful for me, to me whilst I was doing my APC. I can't have placement students. I'm based from home. I've been based from home for 16 years. I'm, I'm the original home worker, by the way. You know, I can't really have somebody shadowing me at work. It's just my little bit of something to give back. So that brings me to the end of my meander. Let's open up some Q&A. Let's open up the chat. We're gonna Dave, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll assist you with this. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes to go. So, I mean, the, the first question I could see is, I think, just around the documents, around the ethics competency. Perhaps maybe if you could explain uh, what documents are there um, and ones that candidates need to be aware of. Yeah, it's, they are there. They're all hidden on the RICS website. The RICS website is awful still. Sorry, RICS, but it is. Uh, the rules of conduct, the page for that, if you put RICS rules of conduct you'll on Google, you'll go straight to a page which has got everything you need to know about it. Rules of conduct, the basis to the conclusions, how they formulated them, and also the examples. For everything else, you'll have to dig a little bit deeper on the RICS website, I'm afraid. 
the best place to go is to firms regulation. And that's why I've said set up a desktop pretend firm and go through the steps, what you'll need to do to set up a regulated firm. Don't just try and read completely out of context professional indemnity insurance requirements. If you do it as part of setting up this pretend firm, again, tell your boss so they don't think you're moonlighting or anything, that'll help you understand it. And also, it'll act as a simulated exercise for you to meet level three for your APC. Thank you, Kevin. I'll move on to the next question. The next question I've got here is, I, I think this is quite a common question, really, that, that, I, that I've seen helping, helping candidates is, if, uh, yeah, if you have a, uh, I suppose if you get a question wrong within the ethics section of the, the final assessment, is it is it an automatic fail referral? Uh, I think that is a yes. Yes, I hope it is. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, people think assessors are quite harsh. We're not, you know, it is, it is a process and getting this right is part of the process. And however unpalatable it is, you know, I've had candidates and they've had a very good final assessment and completely got a question on regulation wrong at the end. And that's really, um, the, other, the two assessors have gone, oh yeah, they've passed, they've passed. Me as the chair have gone, sorry, can't let them through. So yes, I agree. As Callum said, it is pass or fail. I'm pleased to say, because we need to uphold these standards. Moving on to, I think the last question really in the chat. Um, it's all about, yes, talking about alternative dispute resolution. So they're saying, how deeply do we need to understand the different methods or ways of ADR and how, how they apply? I, I, I assume this will probably depend on what comes and you're doing, but perhaps you can expand. <laughs> It also depends what you put in your submission, turning it on its head, Callum. Uh, I see the odd. Yeah, you know, I get APC candidates mention the phrase dispute resolution. And they seem very surprised when you start asking about ADR. So anything you don't want to get asked, if you don't want to get asked a question on ADR, apart from your mandatory parts, don't mention it, but you need to know the mechanisms of it. You need to know that independent redress is available. What's the difference between adjudication and mediation and all different types of redress. The fact that RICS is available for it. But again, it's all there on the RICS website. It's, it may seem a burden to learn all this, but there is a reason behind it. If you don't know and your driving test, but the circle, the white circle with the, the black stripe in it means national speed limit. You know, it's, it's the theory test behind it. But ADR, yeah, it's requirements. You need to, yeah, you, you, you may never come across it. I've never, I've never thankfully had to use ADR, but you, know, you have to know the mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another question has come through. What are the most common mistakes regarding ethics questions during an APC interview? Perhaps you can give some examples that you've come across. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's not knowing it or a mind fog. Don't forget, it's quite a tiring hour. And the, the hit on these questions comes at the end. I think it's when candidates start to guess, start to babble. You can... And, a candidate who doesn't know has this kind of scared look on the face. And, and the assessor, we're, if you've never sat at the APC, the assessors are there to help you through it. We want you to pass. We want you to follow the process and pass within the requirements. If you're not successful, you're not successful. But it's when candidates don't know things and start to babble, run off cover. You know, I've heard, I've heard crazy, just laughable, laughable. I'm not going to go into them. So <laughs> you said there might be, but bizarre answers. Rather than saying, I can't remember at this time, I would have to look at the RICS website. If somebody asked me a question and I couldn't remember off the top of my head about regulation, I would do the sensible thing and look on the RICS website. Uh, that's a classic one. Pete. Indemnity insurance. Yeah, I'm going to cards on the table. Professional indemnity insurance is the one that seems to stump most people, probably because it's 
the most prescriptive in terms of what levels you need, where you buy it from, and also runoff cover. And if anybody doesn't know what runoff cover is, one day I plan to retire. So probably when I'm 80 at the, the current rate with my mortgage is going. But say, say I want to retire when I'm 70. When I'm 65, I'll start speaking to my insurer and say, insurance company, I want to retire when I'm 70. And they start to build the risk profile. So when I'm 70 and go, all right, I'm retiring. I have to do the gardening now. I still have to take insurance for past work for six years. And that's called runoff cover. So let's explain that. Sorry, Calamar, digress. That's fine. Uh, right, it's time to come to the time. So I'll make this this one the last question. Uh, it's about bylaws. Uh, well, more about, you know, are they are they asked frequently at interview? Uh, perhaps there's any questions that panellists may ask. Could you expand maybe on that? No, the, there's not enough time to ask questions on things like the bylaws. However, I would read them because it puts things into context. When these new rules of conduct came out, I read them, studied them, and then went back to the bylaws just to see how they still, you know, it, it's like it's like the policy. The bylaws are the policy, but the procedures are things like professional indemnity insurance requirements, ADR requirements. So you, the bylaws are helpful. Not only does it set the framework, but it sets the concept. But no, you, 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 I've never known anybody be asked about the bylaws. It's a pretty keen chair to get into that territory. Okay, great. Well, I think that uh, brings us to a close, Dave. So I think I'd take this opportunity just to thank you for, for your hour, really, uh, in, in just giving a bit more insight into the competency. And I hope everyone listening is, uh, you know, all the, all the questions have been answered and it's a bit clearer for them. Um, before we leave you, Kirsty's kindly put within the chat a link to uh, to join Matrix for those who, who haven't already. Uh, as I say, I chair the Merseyside and Cheshire Committee myself, so all I can say is that you know, it's highly recommended that you get involved with it. Um, so there's a link in the chat, say just follow that and, and, and register, and then you'll be assigned to your your regional uh, committee, and then you'll slowly but surely start uh, uh, getting events coming through for you to interact with. So I say many thanks for everyone for joining us this afternoon. David, thanks for your time. Thank you. And thanks for the invite. And, you know, Callum, you've done a great job all the time you've been chair. I, I'm in Merseyside and Cheshire. I'm basically in Formby. So you know, it's, it's great to see how Callum's kept Matrix going in my local area through the, the challenges of lockdown over the last few years. So thanks. Thanks to Cam. Thanks for the inviting. Thanks for Kirsty for facilitating this session. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Bye now. <laughs>